Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the seventh yeah. annual Joseph F. Mulligan Memorial Lecture. And I'd like to welcome all of you here and our distinguished guests, Mrs. Mulligan, of course, the dean, the vice presidents, professors, staff, faculty, students, everyone. Um, this has become a great tradition in our department, I think, and it's going to continue to be so. And as you know, that um, <coughs> Joe Mulligan was the founding dean of, of UMBC, of the graduate school, and he was a physics professor also, and was very interested in the history of physics. And um, his memory is, is continued on through the generous donation from Mrs. Mulligan. So would you all give me a round of applause for that? Um, today's lecture is going to be given by Diana Marcou, and she's going to tell us about neutrinos. And I think, does anybody know any neutrino jokes? <laughs> Somebody's got to know a neutrino joke. Yeah. Oh, we don't serve your kind here. Yeah. And faster and light neutrino entered the bar. Very good. Got a, anybody got another neutrino joke? No? You're looking one up on the internet? No. Okay. Uh, before we start today's lecture, I introduce uh, Diana and her, and her mentor, uh, Katja Pachmit. I'd like to um, announce next year's Mulligan Award winner, and this is going to be Kim Berghaus. Please stand up. Wow. Uh, Kim's going to be the first undergraduate to give this talk, and uh, she's going to tell us about Einstein. The life of Einstein, and she's been a fan of Einstein, and he's been a hero to her most of her life. Kim is from Germany, and she's also on the tennis team here at UMBC, so let's give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> and for the very first time, the Mulligan Lecture will be delivered in German. <laughs> so you all have a year to get, you know, get your burlets out and start, start looking at, you know, what's like. Maybe a little bit. So today's uh, lecture will be given by Diana Marcou, graduate student here in our department. And to introduce her is Dr. Katja Potschmidt, who is a faculty member of an adjunct faculty in this department and a research scientist in CREST. And so, Katja, please. Yes, thank you. So I'm very happy to introduce Diana Marcou. Um, she's a today's Joseph F. Mulligan lecture speaker to you. Diana came to the U.S. in 2006. Um, from Romania, and she came here to study physics and astrophysics, which she did, she, and is still doing, of course, so she um, got her bachelor degree in astrophysics from George Mason University in 2010, and since then she has been a student here at UNBC, a physics student, um, and first um, obtained her master's degree here, and is now working towards her PhD, PhD degree. And um, for that, she is studying the X-rays of neutron stars. That is something that she's doing together with me at uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And as you already heard, her topic today, um, we will be hearing from her about neutrinos and how these very fascinating particles were first discovered. And uh, personally, I think the neutrinos and the story of the neutrino it's one of the most um, exciting success stories in science history, and so I hope you enjoy hearing about them from Diana. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you everyone for coming to this year's Malgan Lecture. Today I want to talk to you about a topic that I think is very interesting. Um, convoluted, controversial, quite fascinating, that has um, created a lot of chaos in the world of physics and especially particle physics in the past eight decades. And it has caused a huge uproar in, uh, in these fields and has raised a lot of questions. The problem is actually described by something very, very small, uh, very neutral, and without Further ado, I give you the little neutral ones, also known as the neutrinos, a history and their role in astrophysics. Since this is a historical presentation, I'm going to talk first about <coughs> the status of physics before the 1930s. And this is a list of a few important physics discoveries that occurred before 1930. And two that we are very interested in and have to do with our topic are the discovery by Henri Becquerel in 1896. In particular, what he discovered was beta, uh, beta decay. And 
Related to the beta decay is actually another um, discovery in 1930 by Wolfgang Pauli, who postulated the existence of a new particle, an electrically small massless particle, electrically neutral particle. So, as I said, our story begins in 1930 with the beta decay. And I'm going to explain to you briefly what the beta decay involves. The beta decay represents the spontaneous change of an atomic nucleus into a nucleus of a different atom, of a different particle, with the emission of an electron. Sounds pretty simple, A equals B plus C. As an example, what was being studied was the decay of radium into actinium, and you lose a beta particle, which they knew back then beta, beta, beta particle was actually an electron, thus the name the beta decay. What happens, well, what we know now happens inside the nucleus was that the neutron trans uh, spontaneously decayed into a proton and an electron, or a beta particle. Now, this beta decay was going through a little bit of a crisis in 1930, and I'll explain why. Physicists, when they were running this experiment, were expecting to see the electron come out of the reaction with the same energy all the time, right? If you put in, if you put in a certain amount of energy, by conservation of energy, you expect to see the same outcome every time you run the experiment. But what they were actually observing was a, a continuum of uh, energies. So they're like, wait, that's, that's not right. That contradicts the uh, conservation of energy. So what's going on there? Where is this extra energy going? So you might think, well, okay, what's the big deal with that? It's, they're just losing some energy. They're still running the decay and so on. Well, let's put it in a different perspective. Suppose you're a businessman and every time you run a certain transaction, you lose a certain amount of money. And you're expecting to lose a exact amount of money, but then you notice that you're losing a different amount every time. So some of your money is going away and you don't know how. That would cause a crisis, right? If you're a, <laughs> if, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you'd get all your accounts together and be like, well, what's going on here? So going back into the physics world, uh, the physicist Wolfgang Pauli proposed a solution which was considered to every, uh, almost every other physicist completely desperate and crazy. So in 1930, uh, Pauli postulated a particle that had no mass and no electrical charge. So it was basically undetectable. Uh, I really like the way he postulated his idea, so I'm going to read out to you the letter that he sent out to a convention of nuclear physicists that was taking place in Tübingen, Germany in 1930 and he addresses them the following way. Dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen, I have come upon a desperate way out regarding the wrong statistics of the beta decay. To wit, the possibility that there could exist in the nucleus electrically neutral particles, which I shall call neutrons. Uh, for the time being, I dare not publish anything about this idea and address myself to you, dear radioactive ones, with the question how it would be with experimental proof of such a neutron. I admit that my way out may not seem very probable a priori since one would probably have seen the neutrons a long time ago if they exist, but only the ones who dare win. Thus, dear, dear radioactive ones, examine and judge. Unfortunately, I cannot appear personally to begin since a ball in Zurich makes my presence here indispensable. Your most humble servant, Wolfgang Pauli. It was uh, interesting that only later that day <laughs> He stated uh, that he was, he was completely upset at himself for, for stating something like that because he said, I have done something very bad today by proposing a particle <laughs> that cannot be detected. It is something that no physicist should ever do, a theorist in particular. So as you have heard in the letter, he calls this particle a neutron. Two years later after he said that, the actual what, a neutron that we are aware of today was discovered. It was discovered through, sca through a scattering experiment, so it was completely different than what, uh, than what the beta decay was, uh, was undergoing. So what particle was Pauli actually predicting? It was, not, it was not the neutron, so it must have been something else. 
the reason why most physicists thought that his idea was absurd is if we look back at the example of the businessman losing money and one account comes to him and tells him well I know why your money is disappearing the events the invisible man is carrying away it's taking it away right that would be pretty crazy not all physicists thought Pauli was crazy though Fermi Enrico Fermi thought well maybe that could work and then he thought about it some more and realized that there are actually other conserv energy physics convers uh, con um, conservation laws that were being disobeyed in the beta decay so uh, instead of calling it a neutron which was already a term taken he called it a little neutral one mm -hmm. and he was Italian so the word for little neutral one in Italian is a neutrino so in 1933, he wrote a paper with develop, uh, developing the theories uh, of neutrinos, and he got rejected by nature, which um, now people think that pro that probably was one of Fermi's greatest discoveries that actually got rejected initially. And a year later, Fermi got an apprentice, 18-year-old Bruno Pontecorvo. Bruno Pontecorvo is depicted in Fermi's biography, written by Fermi's wife, as a genius scientist. Unfortunately, um, there were hard times back then, especially because they, lived, uh, they had to go through the Second World War. So later, <coughs> afterwards, in 1950, he ended up running away to the USSR. Um, he was a communist, but due to the Iron Curtain that, it, uh, that was around back then, most of his ideas and theories didn't reach the West. That was very unfortunate because he was, he was a very intelligent person and he managed to develop the theories regarding characteristics of neutrinos and properties and interactions decades before they were actually discovered um, in the West, Western Europe and the US. He was also the, thir the first one to actually calculate the probability of detecting these little particles. He compared it to the probability of winning the lottery. Has anyone here won the lottery? No. I kind of assume so because if you had, you probably would be on your own island right now drinking a martini or something. You wouldn't be listening to me. Um, so how would we, how do you think we'd increase our chances of having someone in, that won the lottery in our room. Why more lottery mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Or make a room bigger, right, and get more people in it. That's important because that is how um, the uh, physicists are going to think. I really like this joke because, uh, as you said, you can buy more lottery tickets. So let's say a company buys 200 lottery tickets. Their probability of winning would be 0.000114%. Great odds, right? <laughs> okay, so that was the theory. But now people have started thinking, well, how could we see these neutrinos? So in comes the, physis the nuclear physicist, Frederick Reins. Frederick Reins was hired at the Los Alamos Laboratories in New Mexico in 1944. And uh, he was thinking what challenging physics experiment he could perform. So um, he's, he was familiar with Fermi's work, so he's like, oh, I'm going to try and look for neutrinos. No one's done it before, so it sounds hard, difficult enough. Um, and he actually got a chance to talk to Fermi a few years later. Fermi uh, went to Los Alamos, and they were talking, and they're like, well, you know what? Neither of us re really know how to build a detector. Well, that's a bummer. So they had to postpone. They had to postpone the experiment until Clyde Cohen started working with Frederick Reins and uh, started working on developing a uh, neutrino detector. Their initial idea was very interesting. They thought, "Well, how are we going to create neutrinos?" Mm -hmm. Can you guess what their solution was? They're nuclear physicists. <laughs> A bomb. <laughs> yep. They're like, we're gonna make, a, we're gonna make a nuclear bomb and uh, build a neutrino detector 300 feet away from it. <laughs> <laughs> Even funnier is that the uh, the director at Los Alamos actually gave him approval. <laughs> For 
unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, and it would have it would have been even more difficult because it would have been a one-time thing, and all the experiments had to be, all the equipment had to run perfectly for the experiment to run well. Uh, fortunately, in 1952, Rhines came up with the idea. It's like, well, maybe there's a more controlled way that we can run <laughs> these nuclear reactions. And uh, in Savannah River Plant in South Carolina back then, there was uh, a nuclear reactor. And we're like, well, that sounds a little bit more safe. So they started using a nuclear reactor as a neutrino source, and they built a neutrino detector. On June 14, 1956, they found the first neutrino signatures, and they sent out a telegram instantly to Pauli in Switzerland and told them, we found it. Polly was at a conference. He interrupted the conference, read out the telegram. Uh, everyone cheered with joy, and they all had champagne the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to discuss a little bit about how the neutrinos were detected in their, um, their equipment. This is, this is a slightly uh, more complicated uh, description of what, what goes on inside the detector, but I, I want to talk and walk you through it, uh, through these few equations very briefly, because it's actually quite interesting. Uh, neutrinos can't be observed directly, so what you can observe is some signatures that they leave, leave behind. So, assuming you're a neutrino, you're walking in the detector, and you run into a proton, then you undergo a reaction, and there are two other, uh, two other particles that come out of this. Each of these particles goes through two different kinds of reactions. The result of those reactions are these two gammas that you see right here, which are photons, so radiation, light, which can easily be measured. So uh, these were actually very highly energetic photons. They were gamma rays. So they were detecting these gamma rays and the way they knew it was coming from the neutrino reaction is that these two, uh, these two um, reactions took a different amount of time to, uh, before they completed. So they were looking for a certain difference in time between these two uh, light signatures. So that was how they found the first neutrino. And later on, they even wrote a poem about neutrinos, which I, I'm going to read out loud because it's pretty cute. Neutrinos, they are very small. They have no charge and have no mass. They do not interact at all. The Earth is just a silly ball to them through which they simply pass like dust mace down a dusty hall. By John Updike in 1963. <laughs> cute, right? Okay, so uh, we've talked about nuclear bombs. We've talked about nuclear reactors. Another very important source of neutrinos is actually something that we stare at every day and that is the sun. So the sun is actually quite fascinating <coughs> when it comes to neutrinos, and I'm going to explain why. Uh, now, nowadays, we know that the main energy source for the sun is nuclear fusion. And even though it's a little hard to, actually probably impossible to read these, I'm going to explain uh, what goes on in this reaction right here for those of you who I hope everyone can see. So these are, these are hydrogen atoms that fuse and create a helium atom. Simple as that. Uh, but the important part is outside, uh, other outcomes of this reaction are neutrinos and photons and other particles that might exist. Um, but the important ones are the neutrinos and the photons, so the light. Why are they important? Think of a photon as an extremely friendly friendly person, very friendly particle, likes to talk to everyone, sit down, chat, have a drink. So if you give them a task to go from one place to another, they're going to stop at every friend and talk to them before they reach that uh, destination. Neutrinos, on the other hand, are extremely antisocial and just like to go from one place to another. They don't want to talk to anyone. So imagine a photon and a neutrino leaving the core of the sun where, where they're being created from this reaction. So the photon goes in on this very extensive path because it likes to stop and talk to all the other particles and interact with them. And it can take a photon up to 200,000 years 
to go just from the center of the sun to the outside. Where an, a neutrino can zip right through the sun in two seconds. Uh, important enough to remember that once they're outside the sun, both the photon and the neutrino take only about eight minutes to reach our Earth. Um, so, next time you look at the sun, well, actually, you shouldn't look straight at it because of the morning <laughs> cornea, but <laughs> um, you can think that the photon that's, uh, that's coming towards your eye was created in the very core of the sun around 200,000 years ago. While the neutrinos that are hitting you, and I want to remind everyone that there are neutrinos that are hitting us right now continuously, were created only a few minutes ago. So if you're looking at neutrinos, you're looking at the core, the heart of the sun, almost right as it's happening. And that's where Raymond Davis Jr. comes in because he wanted to look at neutrinos coming from the sun. They're called solar neutrinos. Uh, interestingly enough is that uh, Raymond Davis Jr. graduated from University of Maryland in 1948, yes. And only four years later, he got his PhD in physical chemistry from Yale. Um, he read one of, uh, one of Ponte Corvo's papers on how to detect neutrinos. So Ponte Corvo states, uh, states that you could detect neutrinos using chlorine. Because a neutrino, when it interacts with chlorine, it gives argon and an electron. And if you can count the number of argons that you get, then you can, you can figure out how many neutrinos um, hit the chlorine of, uh, that was in your experiment. So what he did was he built an underground uh, tank, underground because he wanted to shield it for, from cosmic rays. Cosmic rays can't give false data. So he built a tank underground with carbon tetrachloride, which is just the scientific term for cleaning fluid, so bleach. So he used that and ran the experiment with a hundred, uh, with a thousand gallons of cleaning fluid. That's quite a bit, right? A thousand gallons. And then he managed to get the argon out of the tank with helium. But he was an experimentalist. He didn't know exactly what to expect from the theoretical point of view. And that was where jo uh, John Bacall comes in. And this is a picture of John Bacall. He was a theorist and he was working on theories related to neutrinos. So Davis went and asked him, uh, well, with my tank of a thousand gallons, how many neutrinos can I expect to see? They said you can only expect to see one neutrino every hundred days. And Davis is like, okay, well, fine, I'll build a, I'll build a tank a hundred times bigger. So in 1966, in the Homestake Mine in South Dakota, they worked on building a tank that contained 100,000 gallons of cleaning fluid. The, and this is, this is actually a picture of the, of the <coughs> tank underground in the mine. So it cost them, and back then, $600,000 to build it. Back then, that was a whole lot more money. And uh, Davis made a joke about it, said, yeah, it cost us about 10 minutes of commercial television, <laughs> when you put it that way. The experiment ran for about two years, and the conclusion after two years was that something was definitely wrong, and they couldn't figure out what. Davis was measuring about a third of how many neutrinos Bacall estimated to, uh, to observe. So there should be more neutrinos, but where are they going? Um, what they also knew, and this is an example of how Bacall calculated uh, the number of neutrinos that he expected, this plot is, even though it seems more complicated than, uh, than it actually is, just shows the number, the number also known as the flux of neutrinos, and how many uh, neutrinos of a certain energy you can expect to see. And here if you, you can see chlorine. So they knew that only this amount of neutrinos were expected to uh, be detected by their chlorine experiment. Okay, but people uh, were still confused about why they were seeing even less than that. Um, 
maybe there was something wrong with the experiment or the calculations. Other physicists for about two decades went over the calculations, went over the experiment, nothing was wrong. What else can be wrong? Well, maybe the neutrinos are just playing tricks. And surprisingly enough, that's what it was. It was known uh, before, uh, four years before that, that there was another type of neutrino. First neutrino ever discovered, the one that comes from the beta decay, was the electron neutrino. And then they found a muon neutrino. The word for neutrino types is flavors. That's why I added the little strawberry and mm -hmm. chocolate and vanilla flavors. Um, so they knew that there had to be two, uh, there, had, there were different types of neutrinos that existed. But how could this uh, give an answer to the solar neutrino problem that they were seeing? How could this explain the difference in the numbers? Here, uh, uh, and Ponte Corvo, again, comes to the rescue, even though he was still in the USSR, but I guess maybe one or two of his publications got through. Because he was the first one that uh, developed a uh, theory long, a few decades, uh, about a decade before that, that neutrinos could change from one flavor, one type, to another. Like a person with multi-personality multi multi disorder. <laughs> I think there's a show on that too, on a person that has multiple personalities. So how could this happen? Uh, I mean, it's, how could a particle become another particle just like that? So fortunately, there, we have quantum mechanics that can explain such a phenomenon. This is a... Um, a more simple way of thinking about it. So we, we know that most particles have an associated wave that they travel through space with. But think of the neutrino as having two waves instead of one. But the waves are slightly different. So if you imagine two sort you drop two different uh, pebbles in the water and it forms two kinds of ripples. Um, if the two waves overlap at one point, then your detectors will see an electron neutrino, for example. If they're crossing, so if they overlap in the opposite direction, then you would see a muon or a tau neutrino. Let me explain it in a, in a, in a different way, which uh, I, I like a lot more. Imagine you have a pet, and it's a dog, but it can go through a meta metamorphosis and become a cat. <laughs> your pet starts, uh, starts going around the block, it starts as a dog, it goes around the block, halfway around the block it becomes a cat because it changes in the process. And then it continues going around the block and back, uh, back around and it goes from being a cat to a dog again. That's pretty much what the neutrinos are doing. So if you're at the beginning of the block or halfway around the block, you see either a dog or a cat. But if you're in between, since you can only see cats and dogs, you can't see anything else. So. Um, what can cause this? I don't know if you remember that when I talked about Polly's um, proposition, he stated that this particle had no mass. But quantum mechanics states, wait, if these particles can go through these changes, which are known as neutrino oscillations, then they must have mass. That's kind of contradictory. But this is a phenomenon that could explain the solar neutrino problem because it means that the neutrinos change in type or change in flavor by the time they reach Earth. So people started looking for signatures of these neutrino oscillations. Neutrinos are basically undetectable and when you have two types of neutrinos you need to build a detector that can detect both types. And well, that's a little more complicated. But fortunately we have what's known as Cherenkov radiation. Cherenkov radiation takes place <coughs> when a neutrino hits a deuteron or um, heavy water, also known as heavy water, and it produces an electron. If this is an electron neutrino, an electron will come out. If this is a muon neutrino, as we've seen existed before, then a muon will come out. Both the muon and the electron are negatively charged particles. That's important because these negatively charged particles in water, for example, so in a material, can travel 
faster than the light in that material. So they cannot travel faster than the light in vacuum, then, but they can travel faster than the light in a material. And that produces a blue cone of light, which is known as Cherenkov light. This Cherenkov light in a detector is um, read out by a photomultiplier tube, and then uh, the information is transmitted to computers and the data is analyzed. And you can figure out how energetic the particles are, which direction they came from, um, so, what really saved, uh, made people able to detect both types of neutrinos was this Cherenkov light detected by the photomultiplier tubes. This is something that I thought was very <laughs> cool related to Cherenkov radiation. For those of you familiar with the comic book and the movie Watchmen, uh, the character Dr. Manhattan, who was a physicist um, and <laughs> went through a uh, crazy reaction, uh, actually glows blue due to Cherenkov light. <laughs> he, that, I'm serious, Alan Moore writes that in his comic book, so that's cool. Okay, <laughs> so detectors were being built to, uh, to try to find signatures of these uh, flavor changes of these oscillations. So in Japan, now, in the late 1990s, the Super Kamioka Neutrino Detection Experiment, also known as the Super K for short, uh, was being built. Super K was uh, located about 3,000 feet underground and had 50,000 tons of water. Um, and it was, uh, by, by that point, it was the biggest neutrino detector built. Fortunately, um, it came to the rescue and actually were able to find uh, signatures of neutrino oscillations. These were the very this was the very first proof that neutrinos oscillated and that they had mass. This is a discovery that turned a lot of things, uh, turned upside down a lot of things that people knew about particle physics back then. Um, this is a picture of the inside of the detector and to give you an idea of the scale, see this white line over here? looks like a white line. That's actually a person with a blue cap on. So, it's huge. Oh, and also these um, golden semispheres, these are the detectors. These are the photomultiplier tubes that read off the Cherenkov light as it's coming in. Okay, we know neutrinos oscillate, but those were neutrinos created in a, in a nuclear reactor. How about the solar neutrinos that Davis was trying to look for? Well, uh, there's an, uh, later on there was another uh, neutrino detector being built called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, uh, um, also known as SNO, and that was built, being built in Canada. It was a little bit further underground. It was 6, 000, uh, around 6,000 feet underground, but it was a little bit smaller. So it had only 1,000 tons of water instead of it. This is a, hmm? Oh, sorry, I thought I heard a question. This is a schematic of the detector. These are um, tunnels, and then you go underground into uh, this area where the sphere containing the water, the 1,000 tons of water, was being built. And SNO brought the first, uh, the first proof that the solar neutrinos were also undergoing oscillations, which meant that uh, Davis and Bacall were actually measuring the correct thing. They were just not able to measure all the neutrinos as they were changing flavor, but just the, uh, just the electron neutrino. And I'm going to explain how that was, how it was observed. Chlorine the chlorine experiment they knew uh, could only observe a certain quantity, but still they were expecting to see this yellow, uh, this yellow amount of neutrinos, and what they were seeing was only the amount uh, in blue. But since neutrinos were changing flavors, they couldn't measure muon or tau neutrinos, but when SNL came around and was able to measure all of them, even those that changed flavor throughout their path from the sun to the earth, they found a correlation. So, neutri solar neutrino mystery solved. This is a picture of SNO, the detector inside. 
And this is, this is again a really big detector. This is the size of a person right here. And these are photomultiplier tubes that you see the dots, the golden dots. And another interesting picture is, imagine yourself, uh, let me go back to the previous one. Uh, okay, imagine yourself sitting right beneath the sphere, right beneath the sphere. If you look up, this is what you see. So you see a huge uh, glass sphere filled with water and all of these around it, all of these uh, golden dots are detectors. We talked about the sun, uh, we talked about nuclear explosions, nuclear reactors. Another very important source of neutrinos in the universe are supernovae. Supernovae are exploding stars. Um, the most uh, shaking, uh, ground shaking and fascinating explosions that uh, could ever exist. And this is a picture of what is known as the Crab Nebula. This is a leftover um, after a supernova that occurred in the 11th century. So they're very pretty. But they're also very important because of how they produce neutrinos. This is a detailed schematic, but uh, I'm just going to point out the important parts. We know that uh, very massive stars either go, super, uh, super, uh, go through a supernova explosion. What happens is a star um, has initially stable fusion inside of it, but when the fusion becomes unstable, the inside of the sun starts collapsing due to gravity, and then you have an outer shell formed. As the center of the star is collapsing, neutrinos are being emitted through a shock, and that shock hits the envelope. Uh, neutrinos can pass really fast through the envelope, but the shock um, makes, causes the explosion right after the neutrinos have passed through it. So what we, what we actually see, the, the beautiful explosion that we see is caused by the neutrinos uh, hitting the envelope. So the neutrinos are the trigger. And as you've, uh, as you've heard, the neutrinos actually escape before the boom. So neutrinos come out of a supernova before the light. And what, uh, how, uh, how have we seen this? Well, in 1987, there was a supernova that occurred um, relatively close to us. Uh, it's in an area called the Large Magellanic Cloud, which, um, and astrophysics distances is right next door, even though it's 150,000 light years away. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one of the brightest uh, and uh, definitely um, strongest supernova in the past few centuries that we've seen. Supernovas are very energetic. 99% of that energy is carried out by neutrinos. 99% of it. So what we see in the visible, optical, uh, infrared, all of the uh, wavelengths of light is actually less than 1%. Also, the number of neutrinos that comes out of a supernova is huge, 10 to the 58. I don't even know how many millions of billions of trillions uh, how that would come out to. And uh, we were fortunate enough that in uh, 1987, uh, Super K was running, and Super K managed to record 11 of those uh, neutrinos. Why? Does it seem small? <laughs> but don't forget, it's like winning the lottery. So the chances, the chances of catching a neutrino is really, really small. 11 is a really big number. <laughs> Because that, those 11 neutrinos give you the information of what happened in the core of the uh, star as it was exploding. And even more interesting is that the neutrinos got to Earth three hours before the light. So there, the boom came, right, uh, came after the neutrinos. Um, if, if the sun were to go supernova, because of uh, what we've just talked, um, the shock from the neutrino hit 
would actually probably pulverize us before we get to see the explosion. We would die from neutrinos um, and we wouldn't get to see the pretty picture afterwards. So neutrinos are important in physics and astrophysics. Astrophysics because of their role in the sun, because the information they, they can give us from, uh, from supernovae. They're, they are the uh, reaction of fission in nuclear reactors. They come even from the center of the Earth. There's radioactivity taking place in the, uh, the center of the Earth. And neutrinos that are, built, uh, that are being created there right now are going through us as we speak. And they're built in particle accelerators, like the one at CERN. Neutrinos are important because um, they represent a link between these fields of physics, between nuclear physics, particle physics, astrophysics and cosmology, they could give us a lot more information than just what we can detect right now. And they're very pesky and hard to see and hard to measure. Currently, there are a few detectors that are um, looking for neutrinos from um, atmospheric neutrinos and solar neutrinos also. One of them is called IceCube. It's located in Antarctica. And the way IceCube works is it has the photomultiplier tubes that we've talked about before that uh, detect the Cherenkov light. That's being, uh, they are being merged into ice, then they're covered back with ice, and they, they're going to be there forever. And they detect the light, the Cherenkov light produced by the neutrinos inside the ice. They, look, they work slightly differently than, uh, than the ones that work with water, but uh, they work under the same principle. And this is a schematic that shows how, um, how the neutrino could be observed. So a neutrino comes in, da, 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 it reacts with a particle, creates a muon, for example, and the muon starts traveling through the ice, creates a, c a blue cone of Cherenkov light, and this light is being detected by what you see as these blue, spot, blue dots. Those are photomultiplier tubes. So those are the detectors of Another, another detector that is currently running and was built in 2008 uh, is located in the Mediterranean Sea and it's called Antares. Um, I was very fortunate this winter. Um, I went to Erlangen in Germany and got to talk to people that are working on Antares equipment and data analysis. So this is a picture that I took with my phone. And this is, this is a photomultiplier <coughs> tube. This is what detects the, rate, the Cherenkov light. Now, these photomultiplier tubes go in these black spheres, and three of them are attached to a cylindrical uh, structure. And these cylindrical structures are then immersed into water and stacked up similarly to... Oh, sorry. Ah, you shouldn't have seen that yet. <laughs> They're stacked up just like the ones in Ice Cube. Um, the next step towards um, improving Antares is actually um, <coughs> improving on Antares and creating more uh, and better detectors is by making the photomultipliers smaller. So they found the technology of making them smaller. So they're going to have more of these. Uh, implement in a sphere so that they can detect the angle at which the light is coming even better. So this is a video that shows how a neutrino is being detected by Antares and this you can actually find on the Antares website. So there's a neutrino coming out from, uh, coming from space towards the earth and it goes through water and there's the interaction that's the cone of Cherenkov light, blue light and those are the detectors stacked up. So the light is being detected by all these photomultiplier tubes that you see light up. Questions for the future. Can the neutrino mass be measured? We still don't know. 
It's, uh, we know the most mass they can have, but we don't know an exact mass. It has not yet been measured. Uh, this causes problems in particle physics because particle physics has is known as the standard model of particle physics, which is uh, contradicted by the, neutri the neutrinos having mass. There's also another issue with most, and we know that most particles have their own antiparticles. For the neutrinos, we don't know what uh, if the antiparticles are the same particles or not. Uh, and what other information can neutrinos give us about the universe, astrophysics, uh, particle, particle physics, and nuclear physics in general? Uh, what to expect for the near future? Uh, we should see larger detectors. Um, we should see more uh, dedicated experiments from uh, particle accelerators. And hopefully at some point in the future, near or far, put an end to the mystery that is the neutrino. I want to finish by thanking Mrs. Mulligan um, for her contribution and her presence, uh, by thanking my advisors uh, Katya Pachman and Dr. Uh, James Franson for helping me work on this, uh, on this project. I want to thank the graduate students at Langen and Germany for walking me through their laboratories and showing me all the cool Antares equipment. And I want to thank the physics department for organizing this talk and allowing me to be here today. Questions? Yeah. You said there was an upper limit on what the mass could be. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know off the top of your head what that is? 0 0.3 electron volts. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm? <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the neutrinos that they thought were going faster than the speed of light from CERN last year, oh. yeah, what kind were they? What flavor were they? Um, actually, uh, I know that this at CERN they use pions to produce neutrinos, and I'm pretty sure they produce electron neutrinos. But they weren't going fast. They were not. Well, we know Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is there any attempt to detect? Would there be anything different about them? In any any experiment one could do? Well, they're very weakly interacting. So in order to, well, I don't even see how a neutrino could be put to rest because they all come out of reactions at very high speeds. Right. So I... Depends on your reference frame, that's true, yeah, but your I'll reference frame would have to be going very darn fast. <laughs> I don't think they're moving faster than the neutrinos because neutrinos are really close to the speed of light, so that would be close to putting a photon to a stop. <laughs> Can we? Because I'll bring up the picture because it's it uh one of my computer decides to work. Okay. So um, when the core collapses, it, besides other um, reactions, it also undergoes beta decay. And um, it undergoes a lot of beta decays. So you have the shock with the electrons going out. Now, the envelope that's the r surrounding, what is it? So if you think of the shock starting from the core towards the edge, um, the envelope is optically thick, which uh, for neutrinos that doesn't matter. They can zip through it, but light is still stuck in there, so it takes a few hours for the light to actually come out of the envelope <coughs> and for the shock to uh, create the explosion. Yep? Can you explain again the turning off radiation when you have like the deuterium interacting with the neutrino? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, think of a sonic why boom. Is, why is there a cone, actually? You know what a sonic boom? Mm -hmm. A sonic, the idea of a sonic boom with rockets, that you have, when a rocket goes faster than the speed of sound, it creates the sonic boom. It's the same idea, only with light. So think of, think of photons as not being the most, uh, the fastest thing in the medium, because the electron can actually be faster than the electron, uh, than the <coughs> photon in water. So it's, it's the same principle as a sonic boom. So this part right here. Um, I just don't get why there's like a, I mean, what's generating the, the cone? The electron? Or the electron, yes. The electron. It's, um, think, uh, think of it this way. <coughs> if you have, if you're on a bridge and you have a river underneath, or not a river, a uh, stationary kind of water, so a lake, and you're dropping a pebble, you see the waves that it forms. If you drop multiple pebbles, and each pebble that you drop is right on the edge of the other one, so I'll, I'll go this way. So you, you drop a pebble, and it creates um, the waves. And then you drop another one right here, and it creates waves this way. And then, uh, and you keep, wait, let me redraw that. Oh. Okay. Um, then you have, how does it go? You have another pebble. On the edge. Hmm? It keeps, it's not that hard. It <laughs> it's not that hard. I'm just not sure how to draw it, but it ends up, ends up creating a cone of, um, a cone-shaped wave, kind of. We can talk about it later on, if you want. I can, I can go further. Yeah. Pure ice, yeah. They can, I mean, I mean, they can use the whole ice as a detector. Um, but I think I think that's about right. They're pretty big. I mean, they can they can put as many tubes as they want. They just keep expanding it all the time, Thank pretty you. much. But I think yeah, that's about one. Yeah, yeah. So the si the size of it really isn't a problem. I mean, they're they're putting they keep putting more and more detectors in. Um, and uh, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, so they're kind of taking over the sea with, with detectors. Mm-hmm. Yep. Are there any other questions? Taking over. Sorry. Yes. Are there any Atari's? They have these PMTs underwater, right? Yeah. So is there a lot of background what yes. you have to worry about? Because I can understand yeah. a nice cube or any of those other detectors to make it black. Yeah. Or looking for us to share in coverage. Yeah, I, they have a lot of background. I don't know the details of how they take out that background. I mean, you have to account for all the stuff moving around, <laughs> algae and stuff. Um, but, um, but yes, they do have a lot of background. They do count for it pretty well. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for a very nice.